Hey, Matt. Nice to meet you. Hey, Matt. Nice to meet you. How's it going? This is Ned Coletti. You're listening to the Pantone 294 Podcast. We have been promoting this throughout the podcast. Finally, the man of the hour, Mr. Ned Coletti, is here with us. He is sitting across from me at the at the Pantone 294 Studios. Mr. Ned Coletti, thank you so much for joining us today on the uh, on the podcast. It's a pleasure to be, uh, be here today. It really is. Uh, Desi, I know you've been oozing with the Ask Him That One question. So you want to start things off because you're just... So excited. <laughs> just holding it in. Just just holding it in. Oh, man. Okay, so there's been an office debate. Before yeah. we get into baseball, yeah. I have to ask you. Yes. Do you believe that pineapple has a place on pizza? No. Oh, what? Oh. It was nice having you here. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to cut the interview a little short. I'm, a, I'm old school. I'm old school. Pineapple has a tremendous place. <laughs> Just not Just a not pizza. A pizza. <laughs> well, the majority of the office will agree with you, with the exception of these four. Oh. Yeah. So it's not a topic the key of- members of the round table. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. So it's not a topic of food. One of the things that I did come across in your book that uh, you had tamales and hamburgers. Yes. How did that combination come about? You know what? I'm not sure. It was a treat. It was uh, it was about once a month. And uh, where I grew up, I grew up in, in the city for a while, lived in a remodel garage, and then out to Franklin Park, which sits on the southeast corner of Air Airport. And about once a month, we would splurge. We would go heavy for dinner, <laughs> and we would we'd get in the car. My mom, my dad, my younger brother, and I, we would drive across the Manhattan Bridge, and they had a little truck stop. At the truck stop, they grilled hamburgers. This is before there were any golden arches or before there was any in and out burger, it was way before that. And uh, they had also sold tamales. And so my dad would always get a tamale and I was always eating a hamburger and it was like a like a big deal for us. Now, well, now you see it. Huh? That I can't tell you. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure it was not as uh, as extensive a menu as you could find today. You mentioned your mom, and that's one of the things that I want to kick this off kind of from the, the beginning and then move our way. Your mom, I wish my mom, I, I love my mom. My mom was very cool, but your mom would take, would, would write down the score as you were, while you were yes. at school. Yeah. You would come home and she'll basically give you the rundown for it. She'll play catch with you. Yes. So um, just tell me a little bit of, how, you know, the, the memories with your mom had growing up. Sure. Um, both my mom and my dad were, were tremendous people. They, um, my dad worked, worked in the factory, and my mom, her job was to be the mom and uh, the wife, the chef, uh, the homemaker, the boss, <laughs> and the organizer, and nobody crossed the mom. You know? uh, they had a great soul to them, they had great spirit to them, they were the love of each other's life. My dad died a young man, and, and my mom was widowed as long as she was married. But um, they looked after people. They had a, um, a spirit in the neighborhood. Everybody looked after everybody. The neighborhood was had no affluence to it. It had blue collar people to it that were, were struggling to get by, uh, old cars. Uh, nobody had a suit. Everybody kind of went went the best way they could to try and get to where they were trying to go. And, and my mom, um, she wasn't a tremendously passionate baseball person, but she knew her son's work. And she made it a point to, to tell us that uh, it was her goal that we went to college. She never went to college. She barely was able to get out of high school. Most of my parents' side of their families, high school at that point in time it was a big deal to graduate from. And so she would tell us, you know, you're going to college, you're going to college. She knew that it came, it came after high school. She didn't know much more than that. But her, she fueled our love for baseball. Um, the Cubs played all day games back then. I grew up a Cub fan. And, um, Come home from school, and we didn't have a scorebook, but she had like a piece of notebook paper. You don't have the internet back then, so <laughs> no internet. We had black and white television. Exactly. So. And so the uh, you know, she would bring me up to date in the World Series, which was all day games too. And I loved in the World Series because my team didn't play it until 
a couple of years <laughs> ago, but uh, uh, she would keep track of everything. And, and she got to know the players and understand, like when Sandy Koufax missed a start because of the Jewish holiday, I mean, you know, we talked about that. And, and we talked about, you know, putting your, your spirituality ahead of everything and that, you know, she praised him for doing something like that. Mm -hmm. And so it was life education as well. It's funny you mentioned the World Series because you growing up uh, a Cub fan, when they finally made it to the World Series, I'm sure you were ecstatic, even though, you, like you said earlier, uh, off, off, off yeah. the, uh, off, you know, recording, that uh, you're a daughter now because you were with the Dodgers since uh, 2005, since 2014. Now you're still here at Spectrum TV. But which team reaching the World Series? Which feat? Which which uh, which accomplished the, the 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 team accomplishing it? Which one did you like? Were more excited for more the Dodgers when they made it last yeah. year because that was you know that's basically you what you, what you put in, or was it, you know the Cubs being a, a lifelong you know Cub fan? Yeah. Well, it was it's very interesting because that day that the Cubs actually beat the Dodgers in Game 5 with a 2016 LCS, uh, it was my last day as a Dodger executive, my last game as a Dodger executive. And so that was bittersweet, you know, because I loved, I, loved, I loved being, working for this organization. It, it meant, it always meant a lot to me to, to drive up uh, Elias and Park Avenue, now Vince Scully Avenue. Uh, and I knew it was a blessing to be able to do it. And I knew when I drove up here the first day, and I came, I came for 25 years with other teams, so I was very familiar with the, the stadium and all that, but when I when I was honored with the opportunity to come to work here, you know, I thought about Jackie Robinson, I thought about um, Ben Scully, Lasorda, all, all these people who I had known uh, throughout my walk and my career, and now I was, in charge of the baseball operation, so I really felt like I, I owed them and I owed the Dodger fans, you know, a, a magnificent turn of events. The team I inherited was 71 and 90, but kind of a uh, maybe the second worst team in the history of the franchise out here in LA. But so I, the, the lead it meant a lot to me, and to walk it down that path. And for two years, I wasn't the GM after I was I was still an employee. As scouter form helps Dan cast and I started doing TV. But my last day, my last game, I should say, as an executive of the organization was that night. So I stood there really, truly rooting for the Dodgers to go to the World Series. Many of those players, the group I was with, that we signed, we signed, we traded for, we, we moved Kenley from behind the plate to right. the mound, developed him to the great talent he has and helped him refine it, bring it to life. And so I had, a, I had a lot of emotion stacked up in that group. There's nobody on the Cubs that I had anything to do with. You were just attached to the team. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was just a place you happened to grow up in. And, and when they got beat, and I happened to be with my uncle, who was a huge Cub fan, and, and looks a little bit like Losorda. And, and he, would, he would wear a Dodger jacket all over Chicago, and people would yell, hey, Tommy, Tommy. And my uncle would wave to him, you know? But, you know, he was hoping that he was hoping that the Cubs and the Dodgers wouldn't play in the LCS, so he wouldn't have to pick one. He was back to back. Now. And he picked the Cubs. You know, he did pick the Cubs that year, and then I got to take him to his first World Series. He was 83 years old, still alive, still doing good, and he rooted for us last year. You know, he, I, we got to the LCS, and I said, so "Uncle Frank, where are you going this year?" You know, and he said, "We had our time last year. We don't need another one for a while." He says, "I want you and your team to go all the way." And so uh, it was phenomenal. But you know, my life has been really blessed beyond measure. I come from a very humble beginning. Uh, I come from great parents. Uh, we had nothing. We thought we had everything. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Listen to the fans on Tonight for podcast. Joining us, joining us in the studio right now is Mr. Ned Coletti, author of The Big Chair, uh, The Smooth Hops and Bad Bounces from the Inside World of the Acclaimed Los Angeles Dodgers. Of course, uh, former GM for the Los Angeles Dodgers. And you can catch him on Spreading TV. Uh, Every day, basically, pretty much, pretty much every day. Free game, post game. Yeah. So, so man, um, let's. Uh, I have a follow up question. Yeah. So now we, you agree to the cup and back and forth. I'm gonna take it back to a little bit negative. 2002, Giants Angels. You were with the Giants. Yes. The lost the World Series Game yeah. Seven. Yes. You were with the Dodgers 2017 when the Dodgers lost to to Astros. Which one was worse? Whoa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know that I don't know that you could uh, 
that I could happily say one was worse than the other. Um, I think 2002 hurt more because the, the, the Giants had a three games to two lead going into game six. So they had two chances to win and had a five nothing lead in game six. And, and lost that and then lost game seven. Um, the last series, 217, was a little bit reversed of that. Houston had the three to two lead. The Dodgers had to win game six, which they did, and, and win game seven, which I, I truly thought they were going to. Uh, because it's hard to be the visiting team, as I knew in 02. It's hard to be the visiting team with a chance to win game six and the entire championship and lose. The longest day of your life is waiting for game seven to start. And, and that's what Houston, and that's, and that's what Houston had to you know, overcome. Um, but it was, you know, I'm getting older too, so it was a, a different feeling of, you know, how many more chances am I going to get to be associated with a great organization that even gets to the World Series, let alone gets to within one game of winning. So they, they both carry their own, um, their own bitterness to them, their own hurt to them. You know, I've, my uh, last 20 some years, uh, blessed to be, you know, I know nobody likes to hear it, the Giants and then the Dodgers, but, you know, I've, the teams I've been with are probably 350 or so games over 500 over 20 years, which is hard to do. It's hard to be over 500. I've been to the postseason a ton of times. Getting to the postseason is not something that I, I've missed. Okay? I've been, I think, maybe 12, 14, 15 times. But to get to the World Series is such a difficult endeavor. I don't care who you are. I don't care how good your team is. It is hard to get there. And uh, to get within one game of winning, that, that's, that is tough. And it's tough to get back to. You know, the 2018 team Dodgers, I think they're a great team. I love what Dave Roberts has done. I love the front office and what they've done. Mm -hmm. It's still going to be hard to get back to. It. And I think we're seeing that in the games. Well, it's still early. I know yeah, people are a little early, that. We, You know, if we were five and two, we wouldn't be putting together a parade route. Yeah. You know, that we're two and five doesn't mean we're going to pack it in and say see you next We actually, it was so funny. Uh, we were at opening day and we seen um, Kershaw, and he took a really cool picture of him. And it was right before you know everyone went in back before you know the starters came out and everything. But Kershaw was literally in the outfield. It was him, like no one else around him. He was sitting down and literally on the grass and just like like so focused. Yeah. And so and you know, I think that kind of like brought it back for us, like, okay, like these guys are coming back from a loss and you know, that has touched them so oh, yeah. deeply. And to see him there, like I really wanted them to win just for that moment because you could see on his face how how it's like, hard. Yeah. You know, and, and players at this day and age, players obviously are, are financially set unless they made some terrible mistakes. But they've exceeded probably all expectations in that vein. But I think if you leave the game without having a world championship associated with it, no matter how many trophies, no matter what the bank account looks like, how many houses, cars, whatever, there's something that doesn't bring you all the way around. It's kind of a circle that doesn't. Absolutely. Alana Reza tweeted that uh, the Astros are 6-1 and one at the time that she, that she tweeted it, and the last time that the Astros were 6-1 was 1988. The same year that the Dodgers won uh, the, the World Series. So hey, hey. That's, <laughs> that's a good sign. That's a good sign. That's a good sign. <laughs> uh, let's take it back though, back to Chicago in the early days. Um, and that's one of the things that I want to know. Were you a member of the left field bleachers? Uh, you know what? I was a uh, I was not a full fledged member of the left field bleacher bombs. Well, which but which the group and we've talked about this off air. You know, your group reminds me of that. That's why I think it was so cool what, what Anton Two Ninety Four does. When I when I first started hearing about it and asking about it, they would I said that's like the left field bleacher bombs. <laughs> much smaller group, much different time. But uh, I was too young to to go out all night. I was too young to. Uh, <laughs> have any uh, adult adult beverages, right. you know, I was uh, just on the other side of the age limit. 
but I, I had a great a great experience and great time spending time in the bleachers of Wrigley Field as a kid, not living anywhere near the stadium, yet traversing a train or a couple buses to get there 40 times a year to sit amongst Are the they still around? Um, not organized. They were organized for probably three or four years, five years. I still happen to see one of them, Mike Murphy, is a dear friend of mine. Um, he was uh, the bugle blower of the, uh, the group. He used to believe, if you can believe this, picture Wrigley Field without the little basket on the outfield wall, without the little pyramid that sits atop that wall. Fans would actually march on that wall during the oh game. My and Murph would lead them. <laughs> Murph would lead them and, and play the bugle and have four or five guys. And then players, would, if there was a bar across the street from Ripley Field underneath the scoreboard, Murphy's bleachers used to be called Rage Bleachers. There it is. There it is. The boss. There it is. That's, a, that's so cool. And uh, so, so you go after the game there, I would have to hang outside. But players would come by all the time and became friends with friends with the team. Murray Banks, Billy Williams, Ronnie Santo, Fergie Jenkins. Uh, all Hall of Famers today, but they they became very close to, to that group of people. And let me just say, like, I'm pretty sure they feel the same way we do. We love when we can see that the players have some sort of reaction yes. to us. Yes, We love it. So, yes. I mean, I'm sure they loved it as well, just to build that yeah, relationship. Yeah, it was very special in everybody's life. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, so, then, I, then just Thinking about what you said, the Lakers love pl playing in Atlanta because Atlanta is you know, the home away from home from LA. Mm -hmm. So I can, you know, that's basically a testament to what you just said. Yeah. So I do have a question. Yeah. Being your book, what inspired you to write your book? Um, interestingly, I I started to write it without any intention of writing it or <laughs> publishing it. I. Um, I've written in the past, I have a little bit of a writer's knack to, to life. And suddenly, when you're the general manager of a team and you can, you can add to the, the amount of time any general manager spends, you can add to it when you're in a market like LA and you're working for an iconic franchise like, like the Dodgers. So my days were full. My days were full from beginning to end. If I woke up in the middle of the night, the team was on my mind. If it was Christmas, the team was on my mind. It never leaves you. Suddenly, you don't have that position anymore, and now suddenly you have this massive void of time. And it, it's great to take a breath, but I had never done that. I, I have had to work at every, everything I've ever done and accomplished in life. I've had to work tirelessly to get there. I'm not brilliant. I'm not uh, exceptionally educated from Ivy League schools. I'm a street guy that went to college that had, that had to figure out a path and figure out how to be successful and how to, how to get from one place to another. So for the first time in my life, I had a chance to take a breath and look out the window and to kind of live life a little bit. But I had so many things that I wanted to put down on paper, just for my own edification, maybe my grandchildren one day, whatever, but just to, to write it down so it didn't become irrelevant to me. And the longer you go, and the more things you forget, the more things that become out, who would care about that, you know? So I would sit uh, in my home here from about 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night till about 3 in the morning, five nights a week. And I put on some good Sinatra, some good Nat King Cole, or, or uh, <laughs> Dean Martin, Chicago. Love your cheese. Band, you know? <laughs> and I put it on softly, and I opened the door. I lived near the ocean a little bit, and I could hear the... the waves and then the breeze blow in and, and I'd write and it was like the fastest five or six hours of the last 15 years for me because I would look up and it'd be 3.30. I would take a topic and I would say, you know what, I'm going to talk about, you know, my night with Frank Sinatra, I haven't done with Sinatra. And I'd work and work and work and it would just flow and then i go, oh my gosh, it's 3.30 in the morning. You know, and so I would go to sleep, I'd work out in the morning, I'd do TV, and I'd come back, and I, I, know I, did, it I did it five nights a week for like five months. And I, with no intention of publishing it, just writing it. Like some people journal, or some people keep a diary. Exactly. That's really how I started to do it. And I was having dinner with, with a longtime buddy of mine, David Israel, who was a, a Chicago sports writer, came out here and started doing television uh, many years ago. And I'm walking through this restaurant, and he calls my name, he's sitting in the middle of the table. And 
and I go over and he goes, Floyd, sit down. He goes, I want you to meet uh, David Bigliano. I said, hey, David, how are you? And uh, my buddy Israel says, David, if this guy ever decides to write a book, you have to represent him. And he says, have you ever, th and David Bigliano says, have you ever thought about writing a book? I said, well, I'm like 400 pages right in right now. He goes, 400 pages? I go, yeah. He goes, who's representing you? I said, nobody. I'm not. You know, it's not a kiss and tell book. It's not a, you know, I don't take, it's not a revenge book. It's just stories of life. Mm -hmm. And I want to put down stories of what it's like to be in the big chair. The different challenges you have, the successes you have, the, the good days you have, the tough days you have. And what it's like to lose a player like Greg Maddox years ago from Chicago to Atlanta. What's it like to trade for Manny Ramirez the day of the deadline? What's it like to go through this? What's it like to sit in St. Louis? And I hate St. Louis. To sit there and watch your team get beat two years in a row with the same guy in the mound, the best lefty I've ever been around, Clayton Kershaw. And I sit in the same seat back, back to back years in the same suite with the same people sitting around me. And you know, what does that feel? And so I, that's, that's the reason I wrote it. And so he says, you should send it to me. He says, I think it'll be a great book. I said, well, let me think about it. I, I'm not, I didn't do it for that. And uh, a couple of weeks went by and I sent him five chapters, just a, a, the intro, the first chapter, the last chapter, the Sinatra chapter, maybe the Greg Maddox chapter, maybe the Manning chapter. I can't remember exactly what I sent him. And uh, I sent him to him on a Friday and on Sunday he sends me three words back, send the rest. <laughs> so I well, said, that's definitely a good thing. So I said to Russ, and he says, you have a bestseller. Nobody's ever done this. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, you know, I'm not. I still wasn't sure if I wanted to do it. I really didn't know if anybody would care about it. You know? No, we do. I, I, it was a beautifully written. Just, and so I, yeah. people who, so we started then. So we started. There's a lot of things that you might have left out. For example, oh. I have a 10 year question I've been dying to ask. I left a ton of stuff out. I can do five more. <laughs> so here's, here's my 10 year question. Finally. My favorite player has been Rafael Fernandez. Yes, sir. Before him, it was Cesar Esteros. Yes, and my sir. best friend Jaime, uh, growing up, we would go to the stadium, and it wasn't Cesar Esteros, it was Cesar Esteros, right? So then, I, I could have been 04, 05, 06, he got injured, and then that's how you were in the It was her in 05. Okay, 05. And Tommy Johnson. There you go. So then you signed for a call, right? Yes. Fast forward, 2008, 2009, um, Breaking news, ESPN, my girl for call signs with the Braves. How sad. I was upset. Two hours later, breaking news, the Dodgers just got for a call. I'm going crazy. Back then, there was no social media. It's like <laughs> young, young Google, um, Yahoo Sports, trying to figure out what's going on. My experience is that it was, it was Yahoo Sports, <laughs> yeah, right? So you're trying to figure out what's going on. Is he a Braves? Is he a Dodger? Is he gone? Is he not? And I, and I think they had a press conference saying that the Dodgers had first year gone for a call. I'm on Yahoo Sports, the Braves are upset. The general, I can't remember who the general manager. He, he's saying, that might be wrong, but I, top of my mind, this is 10 years ago. He said that the, and maybe you could clarify that, and maybe you could go into him, how, how did that happen? How did he went from the Braves to the Dodgers and, and so on? But I, I remember reading an article that said the general manager from the Braves was so upset, and they were publicly and said that they would never do business with the Dodgers ever again. Fast forward, we just trade for camp, right? So can, can you, like, I've been dying to know, like, the behind the scenes, and yeah. you were part of that. Yeah, so I can tell you, I can tell you the story. Uh, Raphael was um, represented by a big agency that Armtello ran in the city here, uh, Wasserman. And he had a couple agents working for him, including Paul Kinzer, who was close with Raffi. He was maybe the closest agent to Raffi. Adam Katz is another agent out of that group, as is Joe Wolf. But I know Adam probably longer than any agent except for Scott Boris. So we had good rapport. I had good rapport with Art Tellum. Uh, we had signed Nomar the same year we signed for Carl, and Nomar was represented by Art. And Art and I had done a lot of business in the past, and we, we had wanted to sign for Carl, and Art knew it. And Art and I, can, and Art was the boss of the organization. He ran, he ran. And so we continue to have conversations. And then suddenly I'm hearing what you're hearing about Atlanta. And I call Arn and I said, What's 
what's up? And he goes, we don't have a deal with them. We need to make a deal with you. Let's, let's continue our conversation. And within 24 hours, we had a deal. I don't know, I can't address what happened on the Atlanta side. I'm not privy to that. All I know is that I, I had a, a direct conversation with the person who led the agency, the I was represented by, that, that never had any break to it. And we would continue to walk that path. And perhaps there was uh, the makings of a deal in Atlanta. Perhaps somebody jumped a gun. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Again, I wasn't on that side of it. I can tell you our view was, yeah, you know, I, I wanted for Carl. We, interestingly enough, signing for Carl the first time was uh, a little bit of a, of a trick. There were three players that I thought could help this team. That's at the 71 and 91 team I inherited, the 05 team. And Sturis was out. Tommy John until like July of the next year. We didn't have a shortstop. I really need some, some more players. I needed to change the culture too. And I had three players I had interest in, big time players. Paul Kirkham, Brian Johns, and Raphael Fakal. And Giles, I thought I had a chance to get with Giles. I, I met with him at Thanksgiving weekend and, and I went there for a while to see what his interest was. Kirko, I thought, was going to go back to Chicago. His relationship with Jerry Ryan Schroeder was very strong. So I knew that was probably not going to work. Um, and so I took Adam Katz to a restaurant in Pasadena, El Fornado. And Adam was one of the people who represented for Kyle. And I said, what's up with, with Raphael? And he said, well, he's got a five-year, $11 million dollar a year contract with the Cubs that he's about to sign. And I said, okay. Uh, we're talking back and forth. So I excuse myself and I go make a phone call to Giles' agent, Joe Beck, in the restaurant. And I excuse myself for five minutes. I said, Joe, what's uh, what's Giles thinking? And he goes, he's probably going to go back to San Diego the next day or two. I said, okay. Come back to the table. I got to think quick. Mm -hmm. I come back to the table and uh, I look at Adam and I said, uh, you know, we do have interest in football. Manny Mota, another player from the Dominican legend, Dodger legend, uh, is somebody that I know for Kyle looks up to, and you know, he said he was like the godfather. And they said, I'd be willing to do a shorter term deal to let Rafi become a free agent sooner and for more money per year. And Adam kind of looks at me, what are you talking about? And I said, I'll give you three years, I was 13. He was getting five times 11. I said, he'll be 30 years old and he's a free agent again. He can go out and do this again, which is what do you hear? how it happened the, the second time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so he says, you know, that sounds pretty interesting. I said, I'd like to fly him out here. I'd like to get Manny Mota here, and our ownership here, and dinner with him and see if he can put this into fruition. And, uh, and that's what happened. So most of the deals happen at the <laughs> dinner, uh, nails happen. We're doing it all wrong. Dinners happen. Every <laughs> we should start the corner restaurant. There was, if, you, if you'll let me talk about the Giants just for a minute, just talk about one oh, of you know? uh, I was at the Rose Bowl. I was living in San Francisco and I was at the Rose Bowl and we were trying to sign Reggie Sanders. And I negotiated, I didn't have a cell phone back then, I negotiated driving up Highway 5 with Reggie's agent. And every pit stop, every truck stop, Las Banos, which is on the way up five, right? I would stop and we would continue to negotiate for 10 or 15 minutes. I get back in the car and I drive another hour or so, stop the car and keep negotiating. Started at the Rose Bowl and finished it in San Mateo, California, all the way up five, step by step by step by step by step. So you learn to negotiate everywhere. That's why your mind is never on. Your mind is never shut down. You are thinking constantly. I have the phone booths and the radio little. During the winter meeting? Yeah. Like on the yeah. elevator? Yes. No. Yes, with the Jimmy Fergusi. God bless you. Meetings go everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you learn to do business every place, every time. So being that, you know, you've, you've been the hand that actually signs all these amazing, amazing players, is there anyone that maybe you regret never signing? Um... 
Stand, stand means one. That's a, that's that's the one that that stands out first. Um, I'd have to look back at the draft, but Arenado, I think, is maybe the best player in the National League. Um, Arenado. Those two trade that we had on the verge, and it's in the book, and it didn't happen for a variety of reasons. Was getting CC Sabathia from Cleveland, and Casey Blake, and, and uh, Jamie Carroll back in 08, which would have put our team in a much better place. Uh, couldn't do it for a couple different reasons. Uh, players were all lined up. There were other factors involved. Um, that one hurt a little bit because it uh, it was it was one of those deals that would have changed the franchise. Absolutely. And then a week later, or two weeks later, we get Manny Ramirez on top of it. With 10 minutes before the deadline. Yeah, and that deal didn't come about until that morning. See, sometimes Adrian Gonzalez came here after a call in April that took until August 25th wow. to grow into a deal. Manny Ramirez was that morning. <laughs> Theo Epstein had called me on Andy LaRoche a handful of times, including the night before the deadline. And I kept saying, what do you need Andy LaRoche for? You've got Lowell, you've got Euclid, you know, you must have a three-way deal going. He said, well, I do. And uh, as I'm watching this thing come across the board, uh, it says that the Red Sox are going to trade Manny to Florida, Florida's going to trade prospects to Pittsburgh, Red Sox are going to trade prospects to Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh's going to send Jason Bay to the Red Sox. So I'm watching that while I'm talking to Theo, and I call him and I said, hey, congratulations, I see that you, you got Manny on it, because you needed to move Manny. Manny and the Red Sox are at odds. And uh, the tone of his voice, I mean, when you negotiate, you learn to listen and always listen really precisely to people's tones, their inflection, anxiety, coolness, calmness, all different dynamics of it. I've known Theo a long time. I've known since he worked for Kevin Towers in San Diego. And I, I thought that the tone of voice for him was a little out of character. And uh, hung up. I don't think that deal's going to happen. I don't know. What about the coach? I said, not who you want to give it back. He said, all right, talk to you. And I went downstairs after the game and talked to Joe Torrey about Greg Maddox, who I was able to get for the second time a couple weeks later. And he goes, you got anything else cooked? And I said, you know. And I said, this is a long shot. I said, but what would you think about adding that in marriage if we could? Why? I go, yeah. He would, oh, my. He would change this team dramatically. And fan base. And yeah, he, he said that. He says, you got a shot at that? I said, then I related the story. I just told you to Joe. I said, it's a long shot. I, I don't know. So I worked the phones till about 2 in the morning. I drive to the South Bay where I live. I take an hour nap. I get up, I shower, and I have a message from Theo. Call me a suit. <laughs> so I call him and he says, uh, hey, um, I gotta move Manny. And Manny's got a no trade clause. And he, he has signed away to come to LA. And he says, Theo, I have no money. I have no money to spend if I did. He goes, you gotta have some money to spend. I said, if I had any money to spend, I'd have CC Sabathia, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any money to spend. I said, so you talk to your ownership. If you wanna move them, and pay the salary and call me back. Otherwise, we don't have, you know, it's deadline. Deadline is one o'clock. This is like five in the morning. So we've only got seven hours to roll here, eight hours to go. Right. So whatever, you know, you had to get you had to get it done. We're going to do it. So I got in the car, started driving. He called me back. He says, we'll do it. Let's figure out the players. I called Frank McCord and I said, Frank, you got a chance to get Manny Ramirez. And Frank <laughs> says, we're not taking on any money. I said, I know, I know. <laughs> He says, when we both get in, we should call Boston. You should talk to ownership level, owner to owner, and make sure that the, what I'm hearing, they're going for. And, and we did that. Then we got Pittsburgh involved, and we walked the walk all the way up to 1 o'clock. Oh and how it works is anytime there's more than $2 million being exchanged, and this was $7.5 million we were getting from the Red Sox, commissioner has to bless the deal. Rob Manford was number two behind Commissioner Seeley. So we all got on the phone, and this is in the book. And it's just, it, it, is this verbal? Yeah, it's like it's like this right here, except we're in, in four different places. New York, oh, wow. Pittsburgh, Boston, <laughs> and LA. And went around the room and said, Ned, uh, tell us the deal that uh, we believe is being made here. We're gonna acquire Manny Ramirez and the remainder of his contract for this year. The Boston Red Sox, $7.5 million. We're trading Andy LaRoche and Brian Morris to the Boston Red Sox. Theo, what do you have? Theo went through trading Andy Ramirez 
and, and this number of dollars to the Los Angeles Dodgers for this player and that player. And then we're adding this player, Brandon Moss, and uh, Hanson, I think Eric Hanson perhaps, or a Hanson pitcher went, uh, went to Pittsburgh. Uh, we're sending those four players to Pittsburgh for Jason Bay. Pittsburgh, what do you have? You know, Huntington says we're going to send Jason Bay to the Boston Red Sox for these four prospects. And it's this the clock is coming up to one o'clock. Oh. And and Bob says, everybody good with this? Yes, yes, yes. Have a deal. Hang up. I walk out of the office and I'm looking at the MLB Network or ESPN Baseball Today or tonight, whatever it was. And they say, and the Red Sox are stuck with Manny Ramirez. They weren't able to train them. And I'm looking, and my, my staff was looking at me because they know where I've been and what I've been doing. And I go, they don't know everything. And our group went crazy. And then, but it took another hour to do it because we all felt, Theo, Neil, myself, we needed to call the players involved too. I needed to get a hold of Andy LaRoche. I needed to get a hold of Brian Morris. I, I couldn't let them hear it on the news. It's not fair. I mean, everybody's human. So I needed to reach out to them, get a hold of them. And when everybody had been aware, then we formally announced it. But one of the little funny sidebars to it is the equipment man for the Red Sox at Fenway Park calls Mitch Poole. You know, who's been here with, uh, with the Dodgers? 30 years. Yeah, more, more than that probably. You know, I mean, he's the one that, that told Tommy Lasorda, Kirk Gibson could hit in, in the World <laughs> Series game in 88. He's been here a long time. So he gets a call from the Red Sox. And he says, let me give you Manny's sizes, you know, for pants and for shoes and, <laughs> and, and, and the bats and this and that. And he goes, what are you giving me this for? And he goes, you just got Manny Ramirez. He goes, get out of here. We didn't get Manny Ramirez. And then he called me, he said, is this true? I said, yeah, we can't announce it. We're still trying to get a hold of Andy and Brian. Sure enough, there it was. And when Manny showed up, Manny, I talked to Manny all that night because he, he wanted to get a certain number, right? And he'd say, how's 24? You know, what's his number in Boston? I said, well, Walter Alston wore that number. And he wasn't aware of Walter Alston. I said, he was our manager before Tommy. Oh, okay. Then he wanted, uh, he went through almost F-34, he went on Fernando Valenzuela, I mean, he went through like everybody's, then he wanted 11, I said, it's Manny Mota, that one I can probably get, because Manny loves to have here, you know, but he goes, how about 99? I said, 99 we can do, <laughs> not a problem. So nobody's worn 99 before, man, and see, so that's cool. I think that the reason, you know, Everything you just told us, I, I, it, the book, it, exactly, the book is literally you, a behind yeah, the scenes yeah. of your you, life. You definitely got to pick it up, pick up the book, the big chair. Before you leave, yeah. I, I just, really quick, since you saw Sandy Koufax in action yep. back in the day, yep. obviously you see Chris Shaw back in the book. Yep. I, I don't want to say who would you build a franchise around, I don't think it's a fair question, but can you just compare the two pictures one? I'd say the, um, I'd say they're both, both obviously special. The, yeah. The, um, the difference that, that I draw is Sandy's career at the big league level started late. Sandy was late 20s by the time he really started to roll. Clayton was 21, 22. Mm -hmm. started to really Sandy pitched through a four-man rotation. Sandy threw well over 300 innings a year. Struck out over 300 hitters a year. Won close to 30 games. Uh, I think his last two seasons, I, I think I have this right, I'm going off memory. I think he completed 27 games the next to last season he pitched in 27 games. The last season he pitched. The game's different today. Absolutely. You know, Clayton won't have 27 complete games his whole career, I don't think. That's not a knock, that's just the way the game is. So you're, we're, we're really comparing while they're Dodgers and while they're left-handed and while they're talented. We're really comparing two different eras. Could could Clayton do what Kershaw? Uh, could Clayton do what Koufax did in the '60s? Pitch every fourth day and throw 350 innings and strike out 350 hitters, whatever those numbers are. I don't know. He's never had to do that. You know? Could could Koufax pitch 220 innings and what would that mean? Would he have pitched longer? With his, with his arm, with his elbow injury, maybe never happened. Also, if, if, again, another era, had Koufax, and I, I think I have this right, had, had Sandy 
Had there been the medical practices there are today, including with, with Dr. Frank Job here in LA, and, and Robert Curlin devised a Tommy John surgery, Sandy may still be pitching. I mean, not today, but I mean, he may have pitched another five or six, seven years. Right. Who knows? So it's, you know, it's a great conversation, but I, it's impossible for me to really legitimately compare one to the other, except to say the organization has been honored to have them both. Absolutely. Well, I, I actually, before you leave, <laughs> I am going to make you compare two yeah. people. Go ahead. Um, it's a fun question. Go ahead. So, if you were on a raft yes. <laughs> in the middle of the ocean, yes. you have a lot to your right, you have Jerry to your left, you can <laughs> only save one. No, wait, wait, let's start. No more. Oh, no more. No you more. have three people. And no the raft just Jerry. flips. <laughs> yeah, there's only, it's a titanic moment, there's only room for one other person. But in titanic, there's room for two. I know, oh, but oh. she just didn't move. Um, what would you, <laughs> what would you do? I'd what rather, you uh, you, 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 I had an easy answer when uh, Nomar wasn't part of it. You, oh, made, no. you, you made it a little tougher, <laughs> but I would have to take Alana. Why? Why not? Exactly. No, 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 I, I, would, I would definitely take Alana. I, I would, I would take Alana. There you go. I mean, I love Jerry. I love Jerry. Jerry's out of my, you know, aside Jerry, Jerry's from Chicago like I am. Uh, with teammates at Spectrum Sports in LA, I do 100 games. I'd probably do 80 sitting next to Jerry. I think uh, being with Jerry on a raft, I think would be a very difficult thing. Uh, I think my ears... You'd probably jump out of the ball. My ears would bleed. I think my ears would bleed after a while. Well, that's a good answer because I would have chosen a lot of my There you go. Yes. The book, once again, is called The Big Chair. Ned Kalani, the smooth hops and the bad bounces from the inside world of the acclaimed Los Angeles Dodgers. Pick up the book, whatever books are sold, Barnes & Noble or Amazon.com. And uh, we do have five books that we're going to get, hopefully we're going to get them signed and let's wrap so them. So keep an eye on our social media, Pento294, for information on how you can get that contest. Also, make sure you follow Nick uh, Coletti on social media, Rio Ned Coletti, C-O-L-L-E-T-T-I, uh, across the board, Instagram or Twitter, Rio Ned Coletti. There's so much stuff we wanted to get into, unfortunately, time. Well, we can do this again sometime if you like, and you know what, I'm going to come and join you. I'm gonna come and join you someplace. Yes, you must come and join us. I love what you do. You're a, you're a you're a tremendous organization. You represent the Dodgers great, and I I will see you on the road someplace. <laughs> Thank you. Thank uh, you. We're, we're not gonna share, but you'll be surprised. Maybe one of these trips, when you come with us, you're gonna see Ned Kaletic sitting right next to you on one of these trips. We'll have a good time too. <laughs> we'll be talking baseball till the wee small hours of the morning. Yes. That, that is so cool. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for thank listening. You. Please uh, follow us on social media. Let us know what you think. Panto294.com. Until next time, thank you for listening to the Panto294 podcast. Peace. <laughs>